has always been madness. But it wasn't until the 19th century that it came to be seen as a disease, to be managed by a new group of experts, psychiatrists. New asylums were built, their walls and bars marking the supposedly clear-cut boundary between the sane and the insane. But in 1887, an enterprising journalist called Elizabeth Cochran, who wrote under the name of Nellie Bly, challenged this. Nellie Bly was on a mission to test out psychiatry. So what she did, she checked into a boarding house and she started pulling strange faces and tugging her hair out and saying everyone around her was crazy. And sure enough, it wasn't long before two doctors had her shipped off to the woman's lunatic asylum in New York. Once inside, she behaved perfectly normally, but it made no difference. As she later wrote, the saner I acted, the crazy they thought I was. Her articles and her book, Ten Days in a Madhouse, showed just how easy it had been to fool the doctors, and just how terrible conditions were inside the asylum. 85 years later, a clinical psychologist called David Rosenhan would do much the same thing. The 1960s was a time of social and cultural revolution. Established ideas, institutions and professions were questioned, and one of them was psychiatry. The 1970s were a very turbulent period for psychiatry. Um, at the time, there were a group of psychiatrists, well in the 1960s anyway, and going through to the 70s, there were a group of psychiatrists who actually badged themselves as anti-psychiatrists. The medical model saying that this is a, a largely physical thing, that people have become mentally ill, and the anti-psychiatry movement was saying that perhaps we should, we should see this in a different way. Thomas Satz argued that psychiatry was a pseudoscience, and the very idea of mental illness was a myth. Irvin Goffman suggested that just being in a mental hospital was enough to drive people insane. And R.D. Lang claimed that what psychiatry said was mental illness was just a rational response to an insane world. What bound them together was objection, a horror at the way that psychiatry was being practiced. In those days, people were largely just incarcerated in big hospitals. I mean, we used to call them loony bins, and in a way, although it's a pejorative, it's a, it, it, is like, it was like a dustbin for people, really. It was horrible. It's a space where you can meet with her, where she's not going to be frightened. R.D. Lang was the most famous of these anti-psychiatrists. It was while listening to one of Lang's lectures that David Rosenhan wondered if there might be a way of actually testing the reliability of psychiatric diagnoses. Can we really tell the sane from the insane? So one evening he called some friends and students and asked them if they'd like to take part in an experiment. His idea was to see if they could get themselves admitted to hospitals as psychiatric patients. And surprisingly, seven of them, three women and four men, agreed. One of them, Martin Seligman, now himself a world-famous psychologist, later explained that Rosenhan could be very persuasive. And he had to be, because this was a tough assignment. I think it had been very frightening for the pseudo-patients when they turn up. These institutions, very intimidating. They have a certain smell to them. However much you see pictures of them, it's nothing like walking in. It's a, it's a physical experience. Of the, there's, you really can't put it into words, the smell, the experience, the feeling of the place, it's intimidating. The would-be patients, none of whom had any history of psychiatric disorder, practiced their roles, including how to avoid swallowing the mass of tablets they'd be sure to be given. They stopped shaving, showering and brushing their teeth. And five days later, they set off. And so began one of the most notorious experiments ever conducted in psychology. An experiment from which psychiatry never quite recovered. Rosenhan and his confederates travelled to 12 hospitals in five different states in the US. To try to get a more representative sample, some of the hospitals were old, some new, some were short-staffed, others well-staffed. After calling for an appointment, the would-be patients presented themselves at the hospitals. They didn't act crazy like Nellie Bly had done. They just faked a single symptom. Yes, when the pseudo patients turn up at the hospital, they would just say, I'm hearing a voice and it's saying to me, hollow, empty, 
thud. And the significance of this uh, is that it doesn't represent any known symptom of a schizophrenic disorder. Uh, so it's quite unique, it's made up. It, no one would have accounted anything like this before. So Rosenhan was giving the doctors a chance here. And apart from saying they heard the voice and giving a false ID, everything else the pseudo patient said was true. Significant events in their life were described exactly as they'd been. And then what happened? They were all diagnosed as insane and admitted to the hospital. All of them? All of them. Once admitted, the pseudo patients stopped faking the symptom and behaved in the way they usually did. Hence the title of the study, being sane in insane places. When asked by staff how they were feeling, they said they were fine. The symptom had disappeared and could they please be released? So what was Rosenhan trying to do here? There were two aims to the study. The first one principally was to investigate psychiatric labels as to whether these would be used in situations where they weren't appropriate. So this was first of all a field experiment. The independent variable being the lack of symptoms in the pseudo patients once admitted and the dependent variable, the responses of the staff. But this wasn't all. Uh, and the second aim of the study was to get some data on what it's actually like to be a patient in a psychiatric hospital. Being sane in insane places then was also a covert participant observation study of the experience of being hospitalised in a psychiatric ward. So what did Rosenhan and his confederates find? How long would it take for their sanity to be detected by the staff? And what would they find out about life on the inside? How different were the mental hospitals of the 1970s from the madhouse of the 1890s described by Nellie Bly? Despite the fact that the hospitals chosen were not particularly bad ones, and the pseudo-patients behaved quite normally throughout their stay, none of them were ever detected by any member of the hospital staff. And this surprised even Rosenhan. But I told friends, I told my family, I get out when, it's, when I can get out, that's all. Be there for a couple of days and I, I get out. Nobody knew I'd be there for two months. <laughs> 